<laughs> so anyways, uh, anyways, before I start, I'd rather you reiterate the views and opinions do not, you know, do not represent the BUEA, Booyah as they call it, or any members or some of the members it might represent, but still. And also, I intend to make this a little different from a lecture in the sense that you hopefully will learn something from this. Uh, I also hope that people at the back are able to hear me. So if I really am not loud enough, I'm a little sick as well. So please tell me if I'm not loud enough. Let's move on. Well, before I go on to any arguments on the state or the government, which I will use interchangeably, so please don't get confused, what is the definition of a government or a state? I will take two hands for this. Is anyone willing to? The government is a social contract between people where we give up certain freedoms and certain rights for the better of Very nice, actually. Do you do philosophy? No. <laughs> That's a very good social contract definition. We have a philosophy major as well here. Uh, it sounds a bit like... Um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and maybe John Rawls. But yeah, anyway, so, but that's a really good definition. That's a very good definition. Is there anyone else? Anyone who can top that one? OK, anyways, moving on. Uh, I'm going to talk firstly about Max Weber, a brilliant sociologist who made a definition about the government, which really is a monopoly of legitimate physical force, or in other words, a monopoly of violence. I. Um, it's not a really horrible thing to state that. It actually is, if you think about it, a definition of, it is a monopoly of violence. But as you see over time, definitions get a little more structured, as he stated as well. I'm sorry, your good name? Sam. Sam, as Sam stated earlier. Um, here's an econ historian. His name is Douglas North. He won the Nobel Prize in, I think, 1991. He worked with John Wallace on another uh, definition, which is a little more structured. Uh, the state organizes other organizations. It supports private ordering of relationships, which means you know all impersonal and anonymous relationships. Without the government, these relationships would not coherently work together. And lastly, a little more of a modern definition, contemporary at least. This is by John Hall and G. Eikenberry in the book The State. It's a set of institutions manned by its own personnel in the center of a territory like the federal government we have in America, and it monopolizes rulemaking. So a little more structured than usual. And if you want the, to know the book, it's in the library, the state, very short. And uh, a lot of information in it. But very brief history of the state. I thought I would actually go through this before, again, introducing the real arguments, because no one seems to know where the government actually even came from at one point. The earliest history was in Mesopotamia, 3000 BC. Marxists claimed that the first state was created to enforce social classes. So the first class that was formed was because of the government, at least according to Marxists and Leninists. Oppenheimer and the ecological theory, farmers who were tied on with their cabbages and whatever they were planting, could not move. So people who came uh, just started taking money off them because, well, farmers couldn't move anywhere. And the other one is because of religious theory. Because, well, you can't go against your deity, and if the state is you know, provided you know, support by your church or by a particular deity at one point of time, you, you seldom go against your state or your government. But what are the problems of, the big, of a big government? I will tell you this list is not exhaustive. I am sure there are plenty, plenty of reasons for the problems of a big government, but I'm going to provide five, and this will be the extent of it. The problems will be in money, continuous intervention, soaring debt, business cycles, and collective corruption. So I'll go through these five points much more in depth. And Milton Friedman, one of my uh, favorite economists, uh, well, I mean, that, that just shows inefficiency, really. And he explains that with his wonderful Sahara Desert analogy. Money. Uh, the classical definition of money used by your classical economist, Jean Baptiste Say, Adam Smith, so on and so forth, was an increase in the money supply. Only in today's time, this is a graph of the M2 money stock. Only in today's time now, it's an increase in the general level of prices of a basket of goods and so on and so forth. But as you can see, the problems with a big government. As the government grows larger, so does entitlements and many different things that it has to support. And as you can see from that creeping up money supply, it doesn't seem to be stopping. And it continues on like this until you get examples of where money fails and where government controlling money failed. There are plenty of examples of this. 
I just put three. I, I couldn't, it would probably take all the slides to put examples of how government is still providing money. So the Song Dynasty was the first dynasty to have fiat money or paper currency in China. It's about 1,000, year 1,000 I think it was, maybe even earlier. They printed so much that it was worth nothing towards the end. Continental Congress, during the war uh, for American Revolution, printed so much, I mean it was done to fund the war. It was printed so much that, well, around 1781 it was stopped and they went back into specie, which is gold standard. And the Stockholm Banco was the first fiat money to arrive in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, the guy who made it, eventually kings tried to fight wars over it. It also went out of commission. They actually jailed the guy and he died in prison eventually. Sad, it was not really his fault. Uh, and there's something that always people go against, you know, free market economics, they call it into Gresham Law. They say any money that is controlled by the free market, like not controlled by the Fed in other words, would have this problem as bad money will drive out good money. But the actual clarification or definition is money that is overvalued artificially by government will drive out in circulation artificially undervalued money. So you know, let's I'm gonna use the gold standard here. If you've got gold standard that by wear and tear is worth less, and the government steps in and says, well that money should still be the same worth as your newly printed money, well that newly printed money will go out while this artificially overvalued money will stay in the market. It's it's I just want to clear that up as a big definition, as a big problem usually people associate free market economics with. Still on the topic of money, the purchasing power of money has fallen drastically since the inception of the Fed, since the beginning of it. As you can see, um, well, that, that has dropped nearly 90 something percent. I will not go on further about that. There's a book, a very good book online as well, a PDF on it, The Inflation Crisis and How to Resolve It. Uh, he speaks, uh, Henry Hazlitt speaks about how since government keeps printing out uh, money and since the Fed keeps printing out money, eventually just loses its value and well it's worth nothing right now but well, I mean you can still buy stuff with it but it's in confidence and in trust in God that we have the money at least it says on the currency anyways and this is from observation and notes uh, I thought intuitively I could present this on a graph for all those very hardline economists I'm sure the supply of money is supposed to be straight but for just for the supply and demand of money I made it diagonal what this shows is that as the government keeps printing out money, the supply of money, the value of money eventually falls, as you see. And as you print more, well, if you think about it, goods and services, if there's more money chasing too few goods, there will be inflation, price inflation. And a big problem of this is savings. If your interest rates don't keep up, or you've got money kept in your piggy bank back home, I, I sure do. Well, yeah, I, I really do, but um, <laughs> for a rainy day. Uh, this will be a hidden tax on the poor because well your money will be worth less it will be able to buy less so that is a problem with continuous printing of money and if quantity of goods doesn't keep up with that well again you'll have inflation and governments never learn only people do and as you see many times that fiat money has failed you could call that not into question but moving on continuous intervention this is a very uh, a theory that is not brought up as much by um, Ludwig von Mises, a big um, economist, of, should have been a prominent economist during the 20th century, but he was shadowed by um, his, um, his student, F.A. Hayek, and John Maynard Keynes. So, um, but he brought this really good argument in his two, one essay, Planning for Freedom, and his other book, uh, Plan Chaos. He stated that once government intervenes in the economy, there will always be unintended consequences. So what does that mean? Once you control one thing, something will happen that the government did not perceive, or did not see that would happen. Let's give an example of milk. He usually likes milk as an example. Uh, government finds milk important. You know, it's good for babies. It's got a lot of um, calcium, so on and so forth. And uh, government imposes a maximum price on milk, which means a lower price than the normal price that would have been offered on the market for all the people who don't have milk. But as milk producers see that their profits have been falling, well, they produce less because they'll move to something else like potato farming or I don't know, the veal market or just, yeah, giving cows for burgers and so on and so forth. 
um, so as milk production falls, government notices this. So it tries to control the factors of production that produce milk. I don't know, a machine that produces milk or the, the price of herding cows, so on and so forth. But as it does this, as a maximum price is imposed on the factors of production, eventually profits fall for that. And people start producing fewer amounts of those. And milk production stays lower or it falls even lower. Eventually, the trend continues. And as you know from the road to serfdom by F.A. Hayek, and a Greek scholar, I think, over like 1000 BC actually stated that before, um, you might eventually end up with socialism, or at least the argument that has been made anyways. And another big unintended consequences example is when the FDA has <clears throat> a number of years that it says that you have to test your drugs and so on and so forth before it goes to the market. Well, in those two, three years of time when it has to be tested, people die from cancer and so on and so forth. When those drugs, who knows, could have been used to help them. I mean, an argument could be made that those drugs were just not clinically proven to be safe and you could have probably killed the patient faster. But it's just an example of unintended consequences. And I'm pretty sure you know where this is. Uh, this next one is going. Soaring debt. The debt stands to around that much. Depends which source you look at. <clears throat> the debt has been rising continuously. Debt has been increasing, you know, over the last 20 years, and just unanimously. And since on the inception again of the financial crisis, well. It's grown quite a bit exponentially, not really, but yeah. Uh, around 10 trillion of the debt is owned by China, quite a bit of it, and people are worried about that to some extent because what if one day it has to be redeemed? There will be panic and instability. And I will bring in our favorite nice BU professor, I'm sure you all have other BU economists that you like, but we have Lawrence Kotlikoff. He ran for president this time, and well, I don't think he actually made it thus far, but sadly. <laughs> but um, he stated very uh, controversially that the US is already bankrupt. Neither spending more nor taxing less will help the country pay its bills. This was him in those days. He wrote, he's the writer of this book, which is in actually Barnes & Noble, and it's a pretty good book. I've read a, a half or three quarters of it. I still have to go through it. But it's um, he explains what the problems are with the with, with the market at the moment, with the American economy. And he says the debt actually stands at $202 trillion. That's about 16 times the amount I stated earlier. No one knows this, it's probably higher than the debt really Greece holds to any amount by far. Uh, and yet no one's panicked just yet because no one knows about it just yet. Why? Firstly, why is this debt calculated as this? He used a accounting method that looks over time how much entitlements have to be paid to how much money that you will be making. It's a perpetuity accounting um, cycle calculation that has been used. And he blames the, he doesn't blame them, but he says the problem is baby boomers coming who are turning old now. And you have to pay about $4 trillion annually when they have to retire eventually, or if not already retired. Uh, and the economy will not be able to produce as much. So what would happen? When, this, uh, when the debt has to be redeemed or called in, or where people lose confidence in the American system. Well, in Zimbabwe, they lost confidence when people, you know, when Mugabe kept sending armies everywhere and giving welfare to his armies when they really didn't want, need it. Uh, the interest rates on the government bonds will rise as people take their money out of the country. As you see with Greece, it was about 6% or something. When it goes to 7%, I think you can actually legally say, you know, there's no coming back from that. It was 30%. 30%? No, I mean on the long term ones? Two years. I, I, I think it reached even higher than 7%. Yeah. Oh, it did it? Okay. I okay. Know, I, know I mean, but Greece was, anyways, bankrupt at one point, and then they claimed they needed. Taxes will have to be rise, risen to pay for its debts, and he says for the, you know, for the gap to be closed, 200 trillion, 2 trillion, you have to double your taxes right now, <coughs> forever, with the amount we are spending. Money will have to be printed to keep everything going. It happened in Zimbabwe, it happened in many different places. And eventually, as the old nursery rhyme incidentally used to describe the bubonic plague in the English, Ringa Ringa Roses, a pocket full of poses, there's actually a nursery rhyme for the back plague, bubonic plague. 
Eventually, we all fall down when that happens, when the debt needs to be called and people lose confidence in the money. Again, on Soaring Debt, this is a book, again, I said that you guys can check later on on this. We'll be posting this presentation online. Uh, I suggest you buy it. It goes to a BU professor, I guess. I guess some loyalty there. But um, it's a very good book. Uh, it provides a very good history about how the financial crisis started, about also you know, how to fix it. <coughs> limited purpose banking and perpetuity accounting cycle calculations. Incidentally, there were some people in the financial crisis, managers and CEOs, who actually were only playing cards and all those poker games instead of actually worrying about financial transactions that were taking place. None of them actually trained in finance. <coughs> um, I think one of the highest people in cabinet in finance in Iceland was a poet. <coughs> so um, specialization at its best. <coughs> Moving on to, well, I think you'll get nowhere I'm going with this one. The housing bubble, and in other words, the business cycles. We, we usually will learn about the real business cycles in our classes and different other ways of seeing how financial turmoil can encompass the whole economy and destroy all our wealth. But I'm going to use a method by, provided by Richard Cantillon, Ludwig von Mises, F.A. Hayek, who's also a Nobel laureate, and Murray Rothbard. These guys were the progenitors of, I will tell you very soon, the Austrian <laughs> business cycle theory. It's something that's not spoken about as much, but these people, these economists, were very much against big government. So I thought it'd be apt to actually include them in this presentation. But anyways, they claim that you know economics, usually supply is supposed to equal demand, and prices are supposed to be equilibrium. But eventually they have disequilibriums, there's violent recessions, violent downturns, and well, why does this happen? This is not supposed to happen in your conventional economic theory. In the invisible hand is supposed to work. Although Joseph Stiglitz states that there's no such thing as an invisible hand. Uh, he, he detests that actually, I met him. He wasn't very happy when I said I really like Milton Friedman. But anyways, I got my book by, signed by him, so I was quite happy. Uh, but yeah, they proposed the Austrian theory of the business cycle. So the Austrian theory of the business cycle, what is it? This is a very, very long time ago essay. I think it was in the 1930s, proposed by Ludwig von Mises. He hated the quantity theory of money, which actually equals MV equals PT, which was a very prominent formula by Milton Friedman. He won the Nobel Prize for another thing, but this is one big thing monetarism was founded upon. Mo uh, it basically is money times the money printed times the velocity is equal to the velocity how it moves in the economy is equal to the price level times the transactions that are made in the economy. But Ludwig von Mises hated this, and from this he actually brings in a business cycle <coughs> that is caused by adhering to this formula. So once government increases the money supply, three stages take place, and it. And to prove it, it actually happened during the German hyperinflation. The first stage, money supply rises faster than the price level. So money supply might rise by 5%, price level will rise by 2%. So what Friedman said, if money supply rises by 5%, price level should rise by 5%, keeping everything constant to a certain extent. So as you see by the first stage, MV is greater than PT. So everything is bliss for the time being. I mean. Nothing's wrong. Then you get the second stage. People are starting to get anxious that, well, prices are going to rise. And they, they fear that it might never stop. So this is the time when the money supply increasing by 5% equals, let's say, prices increasing by 5%. Eventually, you get to the third stage. This is the stage where everything just goes all hell. Um, everybody notices that the amount of money keeps increasing. There's no stopping it. So people eventually go out with their wheelbarrows or go out with whatever they're holding in their money and exchange it for goods and services. This is when MV, the increase in the money supply, is not as fast as the increase in price level. And there's, an, there's a really good graph I could show you about this. Again, a very supply and demand graph. By the way, the demand on this graph is supposed to mean the amount of money you hold on you. On you. So the amount of money I have in my wallet right now, the amount of money I want to keep with me instead of buy goods and services out of it. 
as people lose confidence in the money, they will exchange it. The demand for money will fall, and they will exchange it for other goods and services. Eventually, well, the demand for would usually go completely down, and the value of money would keep falling down because people just want goods and services. They don't want to hold money anymore. This is why the quantity theory money doesn't work, and this is one of the reasons a business cycle comes along, as you've seen in German hyperinflation. As, as incidentally in Argentina, which was supposedly, people would joke, or at least somberly joke, that it was better going on a taxi than in a bus. Because in the bus, you have to pay your money first, then get into the bus, while in a taxi, you can go for the ride, and 20 minutes later, your money's worth less anyways, and you can pay the taxi driver <coughs> the same amount of money, except it was worth less. It's kind of scary, but it just shows how the value of money can fall immensely and a business cycle is created. Another difference I want to get is Hayek in triangles. This is, you'll never hear about this unless you were to read it somewhere in, by Hayek. Um, again, the Keynes and Hayek debate, for those who do not know, there's a very good uh, documentary commanding Hans on it. Uh, they were the pinnacle of economics. One was free markets, one was government. Uh, at least not government, he loved capitalism, Keynes, let me reiterate. But he wanted intervention in the economy because he felt capitalism would fail. And well, at one point people thought actually the best action would actually go into a central planned economy after the Great Depression because capitalism was always there for violent downturns. So Hayek devised the triangles to explain business cycles. Stages of production, so this is uh, the amount of production you have in, uh, when you're producing goods and services, and consumption on the other side. I'm just going to explain basically what's supposed to happen in the economy, <coughs> not being artificially inflated by the government or money. So why do people save? People save to consume more in the future. They save in banks to, uh, to get interest rates to hopefully send your child to college and so on and so forth. So they hope to consume more into the future. So when entrepreneurs see interest rates fall because of the loanable funds theory, when you're putting more money into the banks, banks want to get rid of the money faster, so interest rates fall because they want people to borrow. So as entrepreneurs see this, they notice that people will want to buy goods in the future. So eventually they will make they will take advantage of the low interest rates and they will start investing in their factories. And as you see, consumption falls and the stages of production rises maybe by one level. So there's six now. So your factory gets bigger in other words. Thus when people start to spend in the near future, as they've accumulated enough money they think they can spend after saving, you get this. The economy starts rising because of consumption and the stages of production keeps rising. This is a normal, organic way to grow an economy without inflating it by government money. Wait, what, what does the red line represent here? Oh, the red line, I'm sorry, um, if I wasn't clear enough. The red line is just to represent what happens as a change. So basically, from here, people save more, so consumption falls, and businesses take control of the low interest rates and invest more in their businesses. So it moves like that. Now I'm using the same red line over here, as people suddenly realize, I mean, not suddenly, as they realize they have enough money in their bank accounts to spend, they will spend it. Consumption rises organically, and as entrepreneurs see them spend more, they will increase their factory sizes and their production to the left, I mean, to the right, sorry. Is that, was that clear enough? Yeah. Okay. yeah. And then, what happens now, when there's credit expansion by factual, um, fractional reserve banking and government just increasing money supply? Well, investors, when the Fed artificially stimulates the economy, they reduce interest rates, as they've done now, as you've seen with the new quantitative easing. Uh, they've tried to concentrate on uh, long-term interest rates, lowering them to about, what, 0 0.25, very low. And when consumers see interest rates are low, well, they start to spend because they're trying <coughs> to take advantage of the low interest rates. Investors think, well, people are saving more because they think they're saving more because of the low interest rate, so they try to invest in the capital. So you got these differing actions happening together. So what does this look like? What does our triangle look like? Well, our triangle looks like that. Poorly created by me, but it looks like that. Um, the stages of production rise, and at the same time, consumption rises, when it's not supposed to happen like that. It's unsustainable, and it creates a bubble, 
or as Murray Rothbard calls it, people try to go for get rich schemes. So basically, your investors, I don't know, when you go and want to take a loan pre financial crisis, and you was to say, I'm worth a million dollars, they probably give you a loan anyways, without actually thinking of the risk of the person that you know you might not have the money to spend in the future to actually pay for the loan in the future. So get rich schemes gets very um, prominent. People make bad decisions. And no one notices that everything is working on a very utopian foundation, something that will not last. The economy goes to an unsustainable growth and a bubble is created. So eventually, people, investors notice that you know consumption is not rising as it was supposed to do with low interest rates in the future, people will spend more. It doesn't rise, so the bubble bursts, people panic. Uh, they start to unemploy, um, you know, send all the people out of their factories and so on and so forth, consumption falls, recession happens. Incidentally, Murray, Murray Rothbard wrote an article about this 30 years ago, and he says capital markets are usually very susceptible to this, susceptible to this. So housing, very you know, high investment type businesses, factories and so on and so forth will be affected by this. The housing bubble basically happened 30 years later. And as you can see, prices fell. When people noticed that you know, there were bad loans, uh, no one was keeping up with the spending, and eventually just prices sky, 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 sky fell, you know, whatever. It fell. <laughs> I get the point there anyways. So basically, that was the business cycle. And that is a cycle you will never hear, you'll never learn, you'll never see in a class. Because, well, it's, it's a very, as a term goes, heterodox economics. No one talks about it other than in a closet somewhere. <laughs> um, collective corruption. This is a little normative, but we'll close with something a little you know, less tedious. Um, collective corruption is something we usually could see through cronyism, crony capitalism, which actually arose during Japan's crisis, because you know uh, everyone and their nephew were getting you know cheap loans from you know from different people high up in command. So cronyism what was to come from that eventually, or as at least Paul Krugman tells me. Um, some people are not happy about that, but anyways, the logical um, collective corruption is the logical result of government intervention. Basically, if I were to bring that down, it will be people high in command will always benefit from government, uh, and the people at the poorest line will not. And I'll, I'll explain this. Paid money produced by the government buys friends. Um, one can see credit agencies really didn't actually properly rate the terrible, terrible stocks and bonds that were being traded. They gave them A ratings when they were actually supposed to be terrible, terrible ones, because well, you know some of them just had awful really to go on further with that. And the highest in power usually will not ask for a change because they benefit greatly from corruption. These people who benefit greatly from it will never change the system. And these people are usually high in command, so you know, you're not gonna stop that. If I were to bring something, the Occupy movement was a little like that. They tried to change the system, although Albe didn't work so well. I mean, they got the word out there and people spoke about it a lot more often, but it eventually, I think, just, it just fell down really, I felt. But anyway, that's a different discussion we could have. But in a flow chart, the economy goes into recession followed by a stimulus, as you've seen three, four, five times. Um, the stimulus always goes to the wealthy first, because you have to pay the banks and their toxic deposits in Bank of America. <coughs> Bank of America, yeah. I got Citizens Bank, by the way. So, uh, yeah, um, I was quite happy that I wasn't in any of that trouble. They were sitting on a lot of toxic assets. Bank of America, like numbers that I can't even quote, um, because they probably will get angry at it. Um, by the time it reaches the poor, by the time a stimulus were to reach the poor, because from the rich it has to finally go down to the poor, your money transfers into higher prices and the money is not worth anything anymore. So the poor really don't benefit. The rich people and, well, the people in, uh, oh, I, I'm not gonna really take a stand, but if, you, if some people want to think of it this way, the people at Wall Street benefit over Main Street. But anyway, that's a, again, I don't want to be political on that, it doesn't represent my views, but it's something, an analogy anyways. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I don't want to sound too awkward with that, but um, this is my presentation. Again, not exhaustive. I'm sure there's many problems with the government you can probably get off. 
moral hazard, in, inefficiency, not you know, consumer sovereignty, social optimization. There's many different problems. But I wanted to end with this. One of my favorite economists, F.A. Hayek, um, it's something that I always like. To, I would like to bring up in class when people model stuff. You know, it just actually basically this quote is for anything that you use to model things. And then Keynes, basically the biggest debate that has happened in the 20th century: free markets versus more government intervention in the economy. And actually, I like this definition. I think we are perched very high up on our ivory tower. And before the financial crisis hit, there were many people and many economists who said. It is the end of recessions. They didn't count depressions or anything like that, but yeah, it was the end of recessions. And they were quite surprised when things like that happened. And the worst part of any presentation is, does anyone have any questions? The most scariest part, anyways. It's probably a little bit like collective corruption anyways over there, as you can see. They saved the lenders first before they saved the foreclosures, but. Thank you.